Thank you, and hello to everybody. So I was just going to start with the question of what does it mean that this is my presentation? Does it mean I wrote it? Does it mean I'm presenting it? Does it mean this has got my ideas behind it? A lot of these sort of this big question is the challenge we face with artificial intelligence and the way we go forward. So remember this question, what does it mean for this to be my presentation? So we'll come back to it towards the end. So I thought I'd start off by just outlining what IB's current policy is in case there's anybody who hasn't gathered it. So if a student uses a text or images or something else from artificial intelligence, such as Jack GPT, first of all, they must put the text in quotation marks. They must make it clear that it comes from an artificial intelligence. And then in the bibliography, they've got to include details of how it came, including the prompt. Now, the thing I want to stress here is it's about transparency. It's about students being clear what is their thinking and what they found from other sources. I have had a few questions about the exact details of how you cite it, or indeed, can you really cite uh, an artificial uh, intelligence? And that's really not the point I'm trying to get across here. I'm trying to make sure that the student is clear what is their own work. Because of that, this applies to all artificially generated work. So even images, text from computer, for when it's writing computer software, all of that, the same principles can be applied. Um, details of this are in the new IB academic integrity policy. There's a whole annex there just about artificial intelligence, and we're in the process of putting more references, more guidance on the PRC, uh, because we've heard that that would be really helpful to teachers. Why have we taken this approach? What's caused it? And there's a nice great big lump of granite revealing that a uh, part of my background is in geology. Well, the first thing is that education shouldn't be like a rock that never changes. I think we've heard that time and time again over the last couple of uh, sessions. And that the education we offer students should reflect the world that they live in. And the reality is that chat, GPT, and other artificial intelligence tools are now a big part of the world that we all live in. It's not that we, we, we can't hope it doesn't happen, we can't run away from it, we've got to think about what it means. And the previous presenter did a wonderful job of explaining some of that. So why have we taken that approach? It's again, assessment has to then value, reflect what we value in education. So if we accept that artificial intelligence is part of the education framework, then what is it we want to assess? Most importantly, we believe in having assessment tools that are more than just examinations. I've heard a lot of comments from people over the last couple of months saying, well, if we just make everything an exam, we can stop them using any artificial intelligence and the problem goes away. But if we do that, we lose so much of what's important because we're just not assessing it. And also, it's really important that we show, demonstrate to students what ethical use of artificial intelligence looks like. Because if we hide from that, how are they going to learn? How are they going to experience it? How are they going to use this new emerging technology ethically in their lives. Now, I know there are issues around data protection and several of the artificial intelligence tools. That's a really good question and one that is beyond my knowledge to really resolve. But I am confident that in the longer term, it will be resolved. If you look at some of the other internet tools that we regularly use, such as Google, other search engines, we have got to the point where 
they are now coming around and need sort of data protection um, legislation. But also, we need to teach our students about what the data protection issues and what sharing all this information means. So there's a double a double element there. So I hope we can start to embrace this as opportunities for education. Teach those new skills that are required in a world where artificial intelligence software exists. The example, the easy example to think about is sort of prompt engineering, which is becoming more and more prevalent. But more than that, understand the importance of critical evaluation and thinking. These tools can help us spend less time writing and more time thinking, and that's what we want for our students. We really do need to emphasise the dangers of bias from artificial intelligence. We know that these systems learn from a body of work, and if that body of work is inherently biased, or if it's incomplete, then the artificial intelligence will be biased and incomplete. It knows what we teach it. And that's also why sometimes artificial intelligence can produce wrong information and students need to know that. But think of all the discussions you've heard on the news over the past week. How often there do you need to take that critical thinking issue with you? How often do you need to say, well, OK, but the that there's bias inherent in the argument you've made there. You haven't looked at things holistically. You haven't thought about things balanced. Or if you have, what balance means means something different to you. So the key message here for me is that these skills that we need to teach people about the dangers of artificial intelligence and its bias are the transferable skills we need to make to all claims that we see. It's not a new skill set, it's just an emphasis on an existing one. And then finally, the bit that really excites me is that we can empower those that are good thinkers, but poor writers. And that's a real paradigm shift. I know when I started off my education, I found maths very difficult. I wasn't one of the high performers. I was struggling in the bottom and suddenly I was allowed a calculator and that meant I could overcome some of the numeracy issues to the point that I went on to study maths at university and indeed do my PhD in maths. But it doesn't change the fact that I find it really challenging to do basic arithmetic and I recognise that by work around that. The same things are true here will be able to use artificial intelligence in a way that supports students who maybe the act of writing that essay is the challenge, not having the thinking behind that essay. So just thinking about that, and this isn't a carefully crafted um, sort of learning model of how you create an essay, it's just a few key points which I think you'll recognise. Let's break it down into but if, if you get second essay to write, you first of all consider the question, then you do your research about what the evidence is and how other people approached it. Then having got all that, you decide what your arguments are and finally you write it. You communicate your arguments effectively. Now, as part of those first two stages, we really would encourage the student to discuss what the question means and what evidence they found with others and to search for references and pieces of information that would be regarded as good practice. When deciding on your argument, that really benefits from being challenged by the teacher or by your peers. So you can test out your arguments, refine them, really come, really understand what it is. And then finally, well, traditionally the communicating element of it is seen as the really important part, but it also can benefit from being challenged by teachers or peers. The whole drafting exercise, draft, redraft, supports that. So 
if I hope we do, we agree that having that engagement with other people is good practice. How does chat GPT or other artificial intelligence fit into this? Well, if it's okay to discuss the question and the evidence you found with other people, is it okay to use chat GPT as a proxy for some of that discussion or a proxy for using some of these search tools? I personally would argue it's probably not as good as talking to other people about it, but it does have a value. Likewise, when you're deciding on your arguments, maybe ChatGBT can be a proxy for the teacher challenge that we have. And then finally, it's not okay to use ChatGBT to write your essay. Unless, of course, it's the skill of writing an essay which we don't actually think is important. Unless, of course, the actual act of writing it is secondary to the key bits that we've addressed in the first three elements. Maybe then the act of writing the essay is a different thing we need to assess outside of this context, at which point maybe using it is. But what I would say is it's not OK if the student uses artificial intelligence to remove themselves from the thinking process. And I absolutely recognise that as a danger that many students may be tempted to use. So um, I've also just put a few slides together on other examples of classroom activity that might help students understand what artificial intelligence and to be honest, this X section has been more than <laughs> exceeded by the previous presenter. Uh, and I just want to flag up, these aren't mine, these came from IB's TOK Curriculum Manager. But here's the first task. It says, dear students, here's some images created using uh, one of the artificial intelligence tools. What do you notice about the two sets of images? What is it? that makes you think, what's, what biases are we seeing from this? What factors are we seeing in this? And then bring that into a classroom discussion. Another example of a classroom activity could be a version of peer feedback to help students develop the skill of crafting and optimising the IA tools that are available so that they can use these effectively as well as ethically. And again, this comes from our TOK curriculum manager. So an example of this might be to start off, put your class in pairs and provide them with some examples of a question of an essay generated by artificial intelligence and get them to describe what they think the key strengths and key weaknesses of this response are and discuss that. And then go on from that to ask them to try and improve the response that the artificial intelligence gave. Testing, exploring, seeing how it reacts. And then finally bring the groups together and discuss and compare their experiences. Now, there's nothing particularly revolutionary about these examples. They're examples that many of you will have been able to think of for yourselves, but it just highlights what we can do in terms of bringing artificial intelligence into the classroom. So, despite my inability to use uh, Power, uh, PowerPoint, what are the threats I see to assessment? Well, the biggest threat I see is that we act out of fear and we revert back to only doing examinations where we can control it. That would be a huge failure on the part of certainly the IB if we were to do that and we won't, but also on the education sector if that became the way that they wanted to deal with it. There are things 
that are best assessed in coursework. And those things are too important not to value. I do think we've got a real threat and a real challenge for us to think about how we give out marks for communication. How do we value communication? How is that redefined in an artificial intelligence world where you can ask the AI to support you and to write these things for you? Also, I think it asks us just real questions about what do we do in situations where the work is just sort of regurgitating the arguments of others or really formulaic tasks where it doesn't require any spark, it just requires us becoming expert in doing something. Now, artificial intelligence can actually do that very well, but is it something that we value? Is it actually something we want to be teaching and to be getting students to do? But equally, I know that often those kind of behaviours are what we award for the lower grades. So do we need to be careful and worrying about setting the bar much higher than it used to be in order to get some of these grades? Can we carry this forward? How do we deal with the fact that we've got a tool now that can do things that uh, we used to value in the same way as with the age of the calculator, actually at higher level, some of those arithmetic tasks aren't seen as valuable, but we can still value the skills of, for example, estimation, so you can get a rough idea of what the answer looks like. So there's a big challenge, I think, here for us to consider about what assessment looks like if we remove some of the things that AI can do. And then finally, there is no getting away from it. Students can get a whole essay with much less work than they used to need to do just for a cut and paste. And I don't want to belittle that. However, following up on that, this is not new. Those kind of threats to assessment have existed for a long time. I'm sure all of you are aware of some of the websites that sort of deconstruct our theory of knowledge titles far more than what a responsible teacher would do, that they try to over support and over direct the students into how to give the answers. I also think that we need to remember that ghostwriting services have existed for a very long time. You can always buy these things on the internet. Many of our students actually have personal tutors in addition to what they have in schools, and those personal tutors can over support students and write things for them. And indeed, they may be fortunate enough to have older siblings who can write this work for them. This is not a new challenge, but it's even easier now. They don't need to find an older brother or sister who's prepared to do it for them and who's happy that that ethical step is reasonable. They don't need to find a tutor who's prepared to overstep the ethical grounds of what makes a good teacher. So these things are going to become easier, which is why I say it's definitely an evolution not a revolution. Now, we, this was touched on in the previous um, presentation, but I'm really not interested in being part of the race between detection software and artificial intelligence software obfuscating the fact that that's where it comes from. What we see at the moment is that there's a definite beginnings of a, a challenge where the detection software gets better, then we see artificial intelligence adapting to it and vice versa. So let's, let's not get part of that. That's not a magic bullet to address it. As 
the member of IB staff who has to set policy for academic integrity, I know the impact that I have when this, I find a student guilty of academic misconduct. I don't take that decision lightly. Therefore, I'm not prepared to say, oh, a black box um, artificial intelligence detection software says, oh, there's a 73% chance of this being generated by artificial intelligence. Oh, it's a 49% chance of being generated by artificial intelligence. That's just not strong enough for me to be able to defend. And also it doesn't give the student a chance to explain what happened and why. This is very different to plagiarism. In plagiarism, I can say to that student, look, here's what you wrote. Here's what was written by somebody else two years ago. Look, they're the same. How come they are the same? Um, occasionally, very occasionally, um, the question is, look, this is the same as somebody else other side of the world who wrote it. How come it's the same? And I can't always understand why, but it clearly is the same. And there's no argument and no debate about that. Detecting whether an AI wrote a piece of work isn't the same. And that's something we need to recognise, that students need to be able to have a defence to say, well, it's not just my student's word against a black box piece of software that says, oh, I think it's an X percentage. Um, also, by allowing ethical use of artificial intelligence software, we encourage it to be used ethically. So by not banning it, by not saying you can't use it, but by saying this is how you should use it, that would encourage students to use it properly. Now, I've said I'm not interested in being part of a race between detection software and artificial intelligence avoiding that. So how does the IB expect us to spot that? And that's really where we turn to our teachers and say, please, as part of what we expect you to do in working with a student creating coursework, those check-in points are the points in which you can see where the student has got to. You're the ones who will be able to spot if a student suddenly jumps from having done nothing to having done a huge amount. Is that fair to our teachers? Well, I'm going to argue, however challenging it may feel, it is fair. This isn't something new we're asking you to do. For a long time, the IB's asked teachers to be alongside students when they're writing their coursework. And in part, that is so that uh, they can support the students, but also it's always been to authenticate that work. All the teachers I've spoken to who have gone through that process of working with the student are pretty confident that they can tell if it's the student's own work. And more than that, teachers have got the proportionate tools to address difficult cases. They can ask the student to describe what they've written. They can ask their students to explain the arguments they've put forward. And in extreme cases, they can ask the student again, OK, well, yep, that's all good research. Please write that piece of work again in controlled conditions. You can have notes, but please redo it again in conditions where I know it is. So these are all things I put proportionate there because that's the point which I don't have those controls when it reaches me. I've got to make much more black, so much more stark choices. Um, finally, what I would say is if teachers feel they're under too much pressure to act with integrity in this way, they're too frightened about the pressure that will come from parents and everything else, 
then we need to look to our school leadership and the IB to support teachers to behave ethically in that way. It's a much bigger issue than just artificial intelligence if teachers are feeling that pressure is overwhelming. So I've spoken a lot about the impact of artificial intelligence on the student, but it's not just about the student. Artificial intelligence impacts on the whole element of the education system. It's going to impact in a positive way on the workload of teachers. It's going to impact in some way, and I don't know how, but I'm sure it will, on the role of teachers. For the IB, we can use artificial intelligence to support the development of curriculum. We can use artificial intelligence to help testing new assessment models. For example, one of the biggest challenges that we always have is that when we have a new assessment model that we haven't done before, how do we test it out? It's burdensome to ask a student to write an assessment, to complete an assessment task, which isn't part of their curriculum, which it sets a, is going in a slightly different direction to what they'll need to do for their assessment, so it's not really great practice for them. That's burdensome. Can we get artificial intelligence to create those samples so we can test them with our examiners? And link to that, we can use it to create some of these curriculum resources as well. And then moving really solidly into my area, can we use artificial intelligence to create assessment questions? Are they better? Are they worse? Are they just different to the questions crafted by hand by our examiners? Can we use them to mark assessments? Are we able to use them to quality check our assessments and make sure it works. So just expanding on a few of those points, ethical use of artificial intelligence to reduce teacher workload. Teachers really can benefit from this. We all now have been a classroom teacher myself. There's occasions when you've just got to write things and it doesn't require all your teaching expertise and all your teaching skills. So you can use it to perhaps for some of these general communications. Actually, it's a really good starting point for quite a few lesson plans. And I've seen a lot of examples of teachers using it as a starting point and then refining it. Just as I want to use it maybe for testing some new assessment models when we can't easily get student work, teachers can use it to create examples of work for students to review and peer review and discuss in the classroom without all those ethical issues of saying, well, yes, this came from uh, a student two years ago. You might know who they are. How do they feel about having a classroom potentially rip apart a piece of work they did? All those are difficult things. And then slightly naughtily, I did suggest that maybe we can use ChatGPT you to write a first draft of the IA policy for your school. However, it's not all as simple as that, is it? Because what is ethical behaviour when it comes to using artificial intelligence to write student reports, student summaries for parents? I know how burdensome some of that is, but also where's the balance? I have heard one teacher uh, say it's a good starting point for me to then refine to make sure it's really bespoke to that parent, that student. I've also, as a parent, received ones where I can quite tell that the teacher probably didn't use artificial intelligence, but it's a very bland response. So where does that balance me land? I don't have the answer to that but I'm hoping you can discuss and decide amongst yourselves. Currently, artificial intelligence is capable of comparing work against a set of criteria. I've got a few issues about their accuracy. I don't think it's perfect yet, but they can do it. Now, for a formative task where we want a student to engage and maybe even disagree with the feedback they receive about a piece of work, Actually, 
those limitations to using artificial intelligence to comment and mark formative assessment probably is okay. It doesn't matter if he gets it slightly wrong because it provokes the student to think about it. So maybe using artificial intelligence in the formative arena would be a really great move. And more than that, I'm sure you've been in these situations, I certainly have, you've got a class of 33 students all doing work, all working hard. Now, there's no way I can get around a second each student finishes the bit that they're doing. Maybe that artificial intelligence would be able to give some instant feedback to students as they progress through their tasks or their classwork. So they're getting a much more bespoke, a much more personalized experience. And then could the artificial intelligence summarize that feedback at the end of the lesson for both the student and the teacher? And I really want to emphasize here, I don't think that artificial intelligence removes the role of a teacher in any way but I do think it raises some really interesting questions for us to consider about how it changes the role and how it can benefit our students by having an intermediate, maybe a low level response feedback during, the, during their study. Now, I've talked about saying, do you know what? I'm comfortable with artificial intelligence in the formative area. What do I feel about high stakes? Well, the first thing to say is it can mark. It can do this. I think it, I personally currently have some concerns at the moment about its reliability. I've seen examples of when, as I have asked it to redo it and challenge it a bit more, it's ended up changing its mind a bit, which is not what I need. Also, I've got some concerns about its accuracy. Often, it seems to pick on some bits and others, so it's not quite there yet. But artificial intelligence will get better in the future. This is a direction of travel where I do think it'll be better. So with that in mind, I've got some challenging questions for you. If I was able to present to you as teachers that showed that the artificial intelligence makes fewer mistakes than in human examiners in marking an essay. So statistically, I can show that it replicates the same standard more often. Would you be happy for its use in high stakes summative assessment, the sort of DP assessments we do? Would that be okay? Does it make a difference if I can't explain to you how it decided on the mark. I just have to say, well, it's learnt from the algorithm. Now, in adaptive testing, we, move, we choose which question the student gets next, depending on their answer to the previous question. And this is a really powerful tool for helping narrow down what we ask the student to the questions that are most appropriate for that student. So you don't have lots of very easy questions for high ability students where we're just inviting them to make mistakes and lose marks. Likewise, we don't end up giving questions to lower grade students that they'll find just impossible, but give them stuff that they can show how they're doing. The challenge with adaptive testing is you've got to mark the previous thing before you move on. Is it okay if I use artificial intelligence for that? If I then get a human marker to do the overall analysis at the end? Is this a route in for me to be able to use adaptive testing? Oral exams. We know that the quality of the person presenting the oral exam makes a huge difference to the student's ability to answer. And currently, because that's a teacher, we see that some students get lucky with a teacher that does it really well, and some students have a teacher that doesn't do it quite so well, and we get an uneven experience, despite all the training and expertise we put in. 
So how about we use an artificial intelligence agent to do that so that every student gets the same high quality experience? And then being mischievous, okay, well, that's a good in principle. So how about I use artificial intelligence to conduct your next job interview? Because that way we can re remove the uh, bias and inconsistency that the uh, human interviewer gives to the process. So it would be fairer, a consistent experience for all. I mean, obviously the, the human manager would then watch the recording to decide who got the job. And then if I push it a little bit further and say that the artificial intelligence gave the manager its opinion as well, what if there was no human element at all to decision making? And I've deliberately chosen job interviews because it would be personal to all of us. But that is just another form of assessment. Now, we're not there yet. But in the next few years, we will need to start thinking about some of these questions. So this is why I'm just thinking about them now. So coming to the conclusion, how should assessment change? Well, really, what I want is for us to use the artificial intelligence as an opportunity to improve things, not to fear it. I want us to follow what we value in education and then assess that. And that's not just about artificial intelligence, that's in general. And following on from what uh, Ollie Pecker said earlier, that does be more critical thinking and also thinking about how you recognize bias and maybe it's more skill set skills based we need to ensure that we set assessment tasks that require students to do more than just gather facts and opinions because that's things that increasingly artificial intelligence will be able to do effectively now we've already seen that with some of the occasions where computers can get a pass mark for some of the real knowledge recall based assessments that are out there and they've always been quite high profile now here at the ib we already try to focus on the higher order skills but we're going to need to think about that even more and we're going to have to redefine some of our assessment tasks to focus on what we want the students to show. A classic example of that is communication skills. We measure communication skills in a lot of our assessments, particularly at the MYP level. What does that look like and how are marks awarded when actually a, a piece of software can take my five key bullet points and turn it into a much better essay than I could ever write. What's communication then? And then finally, we need to adapt to use artificial assessment in our assessments themselves, whether it's the interaction element of being able to talk back and forth, whether it's being able to use that automatic marking to be able to work, uh, to have adaptive testing, or maybe it's about asking the student, OK, that's the answer you gave. Why did you give it? At the moment, it's a very boring thing to say, this, what is your answer and why? Artificial intelligence could do what humans do, which is tailor that why to the answer the student's given. And maybe that's an exciting tool in getting into the deeper thinking of the student. So what are we doing now? Well, the first thing we are doing is we're trying to collate examples of good practice and great practice about how we teach students around artificial intelligence. We know that's something that, the, that our teachers are saying, OK, we get it in theory, but we want examples. And so the examples I've given today and also examples you can start to see from other people like the previous speaker about how do we embed these practices. Um, 
we're also thinking about what skills are needed in a world where artificial intelligence is common. And I've deliberately deleted, uh, scored out the word new there, because I don't actually believe these are new skills. I think that they're skills that have always been there. They just are coming into even more prominence now. And then finally, we need to identify why we need where we need to make quick changes to some of the marketing criteria uh, because of artificial intelligence. I don't believe essay writing is dead. It's still a really powerful way of communicating your ideas to somebody. And I also believe that there are skills that are best assessed using coursework and not exams. So the IB isn't going to get rid of all of its IA because we feel that it's too threatened by artificial intelligence. But we might need to do some tweaking around the edges. We might need to say, maybe we measure communication in a different way now that artificial intelligence can do that bit for us so much more effectively. As I hope you all know, the IB is moving to digital assessment. And that means that student answers can be read much more easily. Um, all of the computer software I've seen so far is really poor at reading student handwriting, particularly when we've inflicted two and a half hours of essay writing on them, which is a different issue altogether. So as we move to that digital assessment, we can start to investigate how good IA marking really can be and initially use it as a quality check with our human markers. So we ask the human marker to markers we've got currently. And then rather than me saying, well, the student didn't get the grade that the school predicted, maybe that's one that I need to go back and check the exam we didn't make a mistake. Or saying, well, the student didn't do well on this paper, but did very well on that paper and that paper. Maybe I should just look again to see if that's a mistake. This could be another way of saying, well, the artificial intelligence thinks that this is this grade. The examiner thinks something different. Maybe that's the one where I need to proactively get a second opinion before we issue results. And the other thing the IB is actively doing at the moment is investigating the scope of artificial intelligence to write exam questions. So this is what we're doing today. And then, again, to finish off, to make you think, for assessment purposes only. If a student understands everything they've submitted, if they can discuss and explain it, if they have been ethical and transparent in how they've used the ideas of others, then does it really matter if somebody else or something else wrote that work? What does it mean for this to be my presentation as opposed to somebody else's presentation? And that, with that incredibly controversial and challenging thought in your mind, what is it that we are trying to assess in our assessments? Thank you very much. And I think we've got a little bit of time left for those questions to be followed up um, and some questions from the floor. Thank you. Matthew Glanville, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid by, or afraid of the scope of things that we're going to have to address. It really just seems to me that what you've presented in, in, to us today is kind of the opening volley in what would be why we uh, how do we assess uh, we in in the pages where you were talking about to what degree would we be comfortable having ourselves assessed by ai um, i have to say i wasn't feeling too comfortable quite yet uh, <laughs> And yet we have to go down this path. Um, thank you very much for, for a great presentation. We do have a couple of questions on the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if we can't get Lassa in through Zoom. 
We may not, but plus, if you can, uh, could you try to speak and see, we'll see if uh, Matthew can hear Hello, can you hear me, Matthew? I think not. Not looking hopeful. Nah. Phone call again? <laughs> okay, so uh, we can do this a little bit like we did it uh, just before Lhasa, a little bit old school. If you want, uh, I'll give you a call and you can uh, ask the questions through your phone. Uh, Lassa, do you have your phone? Yes. Sir. Great. Okay. So ask away. Uh, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions here. One is a question that asks if um, <clears throat> if the IB has planned to look at the way assessments are made to incorporate AI, for instance, when they become digital assessments, just like the calculator is now part of the math and science, will I, any, uh, AI sorry, be part of these exams in the future, perhaps? Um, I know that Microsoft uh, is already thinking about how can they embed some version of artificial intelligence into their software, sort of words and the like. So yes, absolutely. At the point at which these become part of the everyday tools that a student will use in their real world, we need to have those embedded in our exams as well. So yes, that is something. Um, what I will say is that for the next sort of up until 2030, our plans are to introduce um, digital assessments that run alongside our paper assessments at which and we won't be putting artificial intelligence in until we move past that point of having paper because it becomes unfair to compare the two i can't compare a student who's got access to artificial intelligence and a stu uh, in an exam and who doesn't on the paper exam that wouldn't be comparable in any sense Okay, great. Unless I think we have one more question we could reach out concerning the sciences. Yes, we have one question about the, um, let's see here. How does, how do you see AI incorporation in relation to the sciences, IAs, the practical work? Um, so, I, hmm, interesting one. Give me a second to think. So we already have a situation in the sciences where the student has to um, look at, describe the experiment that they're doing. And we quite often see some of those descriptions are formulaic. Um, I would hope we wouldn't go down the route of just removing that or just allowing that to be purely written by an artificial uh, engine because we need to use that to make sure the student understands what they've done and why. Um, the analysis, we already use certain tools for that uh, anyway to pull together the different messages, examples of statistical tools which are effectively um, some form of artificial intelligence. And then when we're trying to come to the conclusions, perhaps we can encourage uh, an approach where we have a much more um, sort of bullet point clearly stated set of explanations and then we don't expect them to be written up smoothly into a consistent narrative because that's a, an action that the I, artificial intelligence can do for us. So again it's about saying what is it that's important, understanding the conclusions that the data presents, what is it that a different skill set, turning those bullet point conclusions into something that is easily communicated with others, and we assess different things in different places. I, I hope that addresses it. Um, apologies if there was a, a deeper element to that that I hadn't thought about. 
Okay, Lasse, if you could uh, continue, I see a few more questions have popped up in the meantime. Yes, um, we have one more here. Um, this is um, from Kerry. As a Lang and Lit teacher, use of language is part of our assessment rubric. Would AI yes. hamper our ability to assess that? What a brilliant question. Um, I, I think, oh, wait, well, take a step back. That's part of what I was trying to get at when I talk about the, how, what does communication mean? How do we do that? So I am very interested to hear and investigate where the line is between a student selecting the correct language to use and the appropriate language to use and why they've used it and a piece of artificial intelligence that could make a suggestion. So I can see a scenario in which maybe um, the artificial intelligence comes up with one way of making the point and then the student starts to explain why they want to use a different set of language to communicate it very differently. So that's the direction of travel. I'm going to hold my hand up here and say um, my background is as a maths teacher. So for all of the uh, language and literature teachers who are throwing up their hands in terror and saying he doesn't understand at all, that is fair enough. But you've put your finger on one of the things we are actively looking at and challenging. Okay, Lassa, and I think we have time for one more question uh, before we have to sign off. Uh, yes, we have one more from, actually from the art teacher at my school. And as true to form, he is throwing a wrench in the whole system, which is great. Great. Um, he's basically writing, if this is not an opportunity for us to completely restructure the whole educational system around this new system. Good luck with that one. How can I say this softly? Yes, I think that artificial intelligence really emphasizes what the IB for many years has tried to say, which is we need to be looking at higher order thinking. We need to understand the why of which we learn. We need to have those critical thinking skills. This has been embedded in our subjects like theory of knowledge for, for many years. Um, I absolutely agree that I think this shift can help move us a step along what's going, what's required. Um, can assessment alone drive this change? No, it needs to be embedded in the same way as Oli Peck was saying earlier about recognising the change this makes to what we value in education, implementing that, and then my job is to make sure that assessment absolutely follows that. But as you'll notice from this presentation, I'm certainly throwing stones, big lumps of granite to say, this does make a difference to what we value. How can we focus more on the higher order thinking skills, the critical thinking, the evaluation, rather than doing what artificial intelligence and indeed some other much less sophisticated software can do on the knowledge recall front. So yes, work with us, change minds across the whole of the business, all of the sector. That we have a uh, <clears throat> gauntlet thrown. Uh, Matthew Glanville, the IB, asking us all to be a part of reinventing education as we know it. Um, what a very thought provoking presentation, uh, Matthew. Thank you for the specifics. Thank you for opening up the scope of our thinking about you know, the roads that we'll be going down in the future uh, with AI. And, uh, I wish you personally a lot of luck. It's a, going to be a big job on your shoulders to be a part of guiding the IB and our associations and our for the coming uh, months and years. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, have a lovely evening. And uh, yep, sure.
Thank you all very much. Keep well.